So we have a very exciting panel. Um, oh, well, uh, first of all, let, let me introduce myself. I'm, I'm Hyun Song Shin. I'm from the BIS, and uh, it's my privilege to, to chair this panel on uh, fintech financial stability and regulation. And uh, it's, uh, you know, this combination of fintech financial stability and regulation, it's, it's, uh, it's acquired a great deal of, uh, you know, poignancy recently because of, uh, uh, of uh, the, the various debates on the entry of big techs into financial services. You know, we had the discussion uh, last summer uh, with the, uh, with the, um, with the uh, uh, planned launch of Libra and uh, thereby uh, you know, connecting the discussion of fintech together with digital currency, which was actually uh, a pretty um, explosive mix. And um, it raises a, a, a host of very interesting and thorny issues because um, uh, fintechs uh, you know, have their established businesses outside finance, and it's fairly recent that uh, they've made uh, uh, inroads into financial services. But um, uh, whether, the, whether they come from e-commerce or, uh, or um, a social media or, or in search, they can harness uh, their um, existing uh, user bases on their existing platforms and potentially use um, and potentially you know, harness uh, their established uh, user base to make very rapid inroads into financial services. And uh, the, uh, the issues that, that the, the entry of uh, fintechs into finance uh, raises partly touches on the traditional questions to do with financial stability. So it uh, you know, certainly touches on the question of uh, you know, this debate that uh, we have in banking about whether uh, profitable banks uh, and uh, fairly uh, non-competitive markets are actually conducive to financial stability, you know, through um, the the banks being able to uh, to earn profits and thereby and thereby you know add to their book equity, um, or to to have very high franchise values and thereby you know act prudently. So there's that school of argument. Uh, on, on the other hand, there is the competition aspect uh, to this as well, which uh, is the more classical set of arguments as to why entry is good. But in the case of big techs and fintechs more generally in finance, it's not clear that uh, the traditional arguments are, uh, are going to you know, fit uh, uh, you know, perfectly for our debate either. And behind all of this is the tremendous opportunities that are raised by technical innovation. And we know, um, at, you know through various papers that are presented at this conference, uh, of the opportunities for financial inclusion uh, that are you know, generated by the use of big data, uh, being able to include uh, you know, users who have been traditionally excluded through lack of documentation, uh, through lack of collateral. Uh, but then if you can use big data and harness the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the analytical powers that uh, machine learning and big data can provide, you can uh, also expand financial services to those who were previously excluded. Um, but, the, but to the extent that all of this is reliant on uh, the way that data can be you know, harnessed to generate network effects and uh, to generate further activity, which in turn strengthens those network effects. There are also a number of, uh, I think, uh, newer but equally, I think, important issues to do with data privacy, the use of data, and uh, more generally how we can think about the, um, uh, the, the incorporation of privacy concerns into traditional regulation um, and competition type, uh, 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 type policy discussions. So, what we'll do is, uh, and we're going to speak in this order in the way that we're, we're seated, um, um, we'll start with uh, Thomas Philippon, who will give us, a, I think, a broader overview of the, um, uh, drawing on some of his recent work on, on the competitive landscape, uh, not uh, focusing exclusively on fintech itself, but drawing from the, from the larger canvas and then, and then zeroing down. Um, and then we'll, we'll go to Antoinette Shaw and then to Susan Enfi. And I'll come back and we can, 
um, have, a, have a broader discussion there. So, Thomas, why don't you kick us off? Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, uh, Hyun, for organizing this, uh, this panel. So, as Hyun was just saying, I want to give you like a, some kind of an overview of finance and then dive into uh, what FinTech is doing. And uh, I want you to take uh, three points away from what I'm going to say. The first one is that I believe the data suggests that finally we see some uh, increasing competition in financial services. So these services are becoming uh, of higher quality and, and cheaper. Uh, and that at least part of this improvement is uh, due to fintech. So fintech, I believe, is reducing uh, the cost of financial intermediation and also improving the average quality of intermediation. So that's kind of the average result. Having said that, then the next natural question is to think about the, the consequences of fintech in terms of the distribution of access to finance. Okay. So then the next two points are specifically about that. The first one is the standard issue of participation. So we know that poor households do not participate in the same way as rich households in financial markets. And the question is, will fintech improve this outcome? And I think that the answer is probably yes. Um, then the next question, so this is about participation. The next question is about discrimination. So we know that there, is, there are many biases and uh, uh, implicit or explicit discrimination in, in access to finance. So we can ask the same question. What is the likely impact of uh, fintech on discrimination? Will it reduce it or increase it? I think that it's plausible, although less certain, that it will uh, decrease uh, discrimination. But it certainly will not uh, eliminate it. Okay? And what I'm going to try to show you is that this is what you get if you try to uh, think about fintech in the standard models that we've used over the years to think about these issues. So let's start with point number one. So this is the stuff I've been working on for many years now. Many of you have seen these graphs before. So this is my overall measure of the cost of, uh, the unit cost of financial intermediation in the US. So it's around two cents on the dollar, which means if you want to create two dollar, one dollar, sorry, of um, financial assets that is intermediated by the financial system. So it could be equity, debt, loans, liquidity management. Uh, on average, it's gonna cost you two cents to do that. Okay, so these two cents, these two percent, that's what, that could be the average spread between lending and borrowing rate, if you think about banking, it could be the average fee, if you think about issuing securities or trading them, it could be a part of the management fees, if you think about asset management. If you aggregate all of these pieces together, it's around two percent. Now, what you see in recent years, uh, this is the, I updated this data for the, the BIS talk that you mentioned earlier, and what you see is um, that both according to the simple uh, green line, which is the non-adjusted measure, the, just the raw data, and the, the red, which is my favorite one, where I try to adjust for changes in the quality of uh, financial services, you see that in recent years, finally, uh, there is some decrease in the unit cost. Okay? It's most obvious in the asset management industries, where clearly fees are going down, and quite substantially. It is true uh, more generally in the finance industry. And I think that's the least you, you could expect, by the way, given that we have so much IT and uh, you know, information and technology equipment in the finance industry, that has to make finance cheaper. Okay? The puzzle was why it didn't happen before, but I think the good news is it's finally happening. And I would argue that uh, in many cases, uh, you can trace it back to the impact of uh, competition from fintech entrant into financial services. So I think that's the broad positive average effect of, of fintech. Um, but then, of course, the next question is, um, even if finance become uh, cheaper on average, it does not mean that everybody's going to benefit. And in fact, there is a very heated debate and strong discussions about the risks that uh, new technology in finance could increase inequality. Okay. And so I want to go through two of the main, these are not the only ones, but I believe these are two of the main arguments. Uh, one is about purely like the access to finance model and the other one is about discrimination. So let's talk about access to finance, and I'm gonna frame that in the case of an asset management uh, problem. Okay, so there I think the issue is that we believe that some of these new technologies uh, in FinTech, in big tech even more so, are built on very strong increasing return to scale. And much of the increasing return comes from uh, the fact that they use a lot of data, and then there's increasing return to data used. So then the fear is that if you have increasing returns, then the small players are 
could potentially be excluded. Okay. So uh, let's think about how that would play out in a simple model of asset management. Okay. And the key point here is I think that um, you have to be very precise about where is the increasing return to scale. Or in other words, what, where are the fixed costs? If you think, I believe, properly about fintech in this world, we realize that the kind of fixed costs that we are looking at are unlikely to increase inequality. In fact, they are likely to improve access to finance. Okay, so let's think, think about that in a simple model. So the, the benchmark model in this case, you have a bunch of households, and the key is that you have rich and poor households. You have a distribution of wealth, W, with some PDF, with some CDF, G of W across households. Okay, and um, the key source of uh, non-convexity at the household level is that there's a fixed cost to setting up an account um, with a broker. Okay? That fixed cost is fee, little fee. And in a model like that, you always have a cutoff. If you're poor, even if finance gives you higher returns, if you're poor, it will never be enough to cover the fixed cost, and therefore the poor households are excluded from the market. Formally, there's a cutoff W bar such that everybody below W bar chooses uh, to not participate or is priced out of the market for asset management. Okay? Uh, and that cutoff is proportional to the, this fixed cost fee uh, of setting up an account or having right relationship with a manager. Um, but then there's the other important piece, which is entry by asset managers. So you have a free entry condition that says that the expected profits of asset managers, E of pi, must be equal to their entry cost, big fee. Okay? That's the other fixed cost. And my point is it's very important to understand that these are completely different fixed costs and they are going to play out very differently. So if you think about fintech, the plausible way to think about fix, fintech is high big fee, low small fee. Okay? Compared to traditional banking, a fintech firm, because all the processes are automated, once you write down the robo-advising software, it does not matter if you have one million clients or two, two million clients. The marginal cost of the extra client is zero. The big fixed cost is setting up the software, the platform, and the uh, all the software, all the code that is behind that. Okay? So it's a model where big fee is high, but little fee is low. Now, in this model, you can see that what's going to happen with a small relationship cost is that you're going to have more participation. Okay? And now, of course, you still have the issue of big, in the sense that the, the fixed cost of entry is large. So you might have few players in the market. Okay? But as long as that number is, too, is not too small, then uh, you would still have more participation by households. So the, the proposition you can show is that if, if fintech ent entry is profitable at all, so start from a model with standard asset management, disrupt it by bringing some robo-advisor. The theorem is as long as entry is profitable by the robo-advisor, then it would lead to more participation. The cutoff under fintech F is going to be lower than the cutoff under banking or traditional asset management B. Okay? And that's a very general result. And why is that? because what matters for the household is the, lo the small fixed cost fee per relationship. The big fixed cost might be high, but in equilibrium, it's paid by the, ho the households that are wealthy. Because when the, when the firm thinks about entering, it knows that it will make a lot of money on the big portfolios. Okay? But once it set up the software to deal with these big portfolios, offering the same service to uh, people with less wealth is not very costly. And so essentially, this is cross subsidization of wealthy households towards poor households. So that's why I think it's likely that in this world of uh, asset management, robo-advising is likely to improve access to finance. More households would, would be able to afford these services. The next uh, and last point is about discrimination. Okay, so I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to think about, take the standard model we've used over many years, so NEA and Kane, um, to think about um, you know, discrimination and think about how FinTech is likely to disrupt uh, the equilibrium. Okay, so this is a classic model. I, I'm, I'm sure many of you know it. You have one dimensional variable, Q, which measures the quality of credit, and um, it has some distribution in the population, but then the population itself has two groups. I mean, you could have more than two, but in the, the simplest one, you have the majority group and the minority group. Okay? And typically, we assume that the minority group either has a lower average quality or has more noise in the signal. Um, then you have the traditional lenders, they meet face to face with their clients. Okay? So that's the, you go to the bank, you ask for a loan. Then the loan officer sees you. But that does two things. That means that immediately they observe your group, whether you're part of the minority or the majority. 
They might not be allowed to use it explicitly in pricing, but they, they do know it. So they see your type, your group, and they get some uh, signal about your quality. Okay? And I think we have enough evidence in that uh, literature to show that we know there is bias there. We know that on average, loan officers are biased against minorities. Okay, that leads to outcomes where the minorities get worse deals on average uh, than the majority. Okay? So that, I think, is the, the heart issue of discrimination. Now, okay, think about that's the starting point, and now you're bringing FinTech. So in my world, I think of FinTech as a way of uh, getting one extra signal or more than one extra signal about the quality, about the borrower, okay, without meeting face to face. That's my definition of fintech, right? So it has two features. You don't meet face to face, and you get an extra signal. Okay, and then think about what it does. And in fact, if you think, if you just go through the math, but if you think about it, it's also pretty clear, you have three cases or three types of issues that can arise. The first I call unbiased univariate. So that means, so unbiased means that the software itself is Bayesian. Okay? It doesn't have a bias, again, unlike the loan officers. And univariate means that it's only producing signal about the true quality of the borrower. Okay? Now this might be corrected with your group, okay? but it is only through the quality of the borrower that the correction will arise, not directly uh, through the group. Okay? So there is obvious in that world that the machines are going to do better than the humans. Okay? They're going to be less biased, they're going to have higher quality signals for the, so for, the, for the minority, so clearly the minority is going to benefit from that. So that's obvious. Then the next step is unbiased multivariate. So this already starts to capture some of the issues that the regulators have in mind. So it's still unbiased in the sense that the model is Bayesian. But the issue is that it's multivariate. And it's, that means it's producing a signal about the true quality Q of the borrower, but also about the, which group the borrower belongs to. Okay? And typically the way it happens in the real world is because if you do enough data mining, you can construct very good proxies for white versus black or Hispanic versus some other ethnicity uh, just by having enough data. So you are not trying to replicate the group, but, the, but there's enough information that you can Okay? And so, in fact, in that world, the fintech is going to give you information about the true quality queue, but also about the group membership. And the problem there is that the way it's going to happen, uh, it's unlikely to be curtailed by the regulation we have on traditional lending. In traditional lending, you are simply not allowed to condition on group membership. But if you get that group membership indirectly, just through data mining, the regulation are going to capture that. So potentially, then, that could lead to uh, more, you know, worse outcome for the minorities. But if you actually crunch the number, you see that in that case, it's still the case that FinTech would reduce biases against minorities. Okay? It would not be as good as the first case, but it's still net welfare positive. So then, the only way you get FinTech to create a worse outcome is if it's bivariate and biased. That, that means that now the, the FinTech algorithm produces information about the true quality, but at the same time, about group membership, and on top of it, the algorithm, perhaps because it was written by humans who are themselves biased, has some bias. Okay? So that's the only case in which um, you can have a worse outcome for the minority in the fintech equilibrium. Okay? Um, so that's possible. Uh, it does, of course, require the bias to be significant. Um, and um, the thing that's interesting there is that even in that worst case scenario, um, this becomes increasingly less likely when the fintech algorithms improve over time. Because when the algorithm improves, no matter what you do, you're going to go towards the Bayesian solution, which by definition is not biased. So, and the, because the FinTech algorithm is going to weigh optimally this, this, this information based on their signal-to-noise ratio, if the algorithm becomes more precise, even if it's biased initially, it's still going to, at some point, be better for the, for the minority. Okay? So to wrap up, if you think about FinTech, I think it has three effects. The first one is it makes finance cheaper and more, uh, higher quality. That's great. Um, in asset management, it's likely to improve, on average, access to uh, financial services. Um, and if you think about discrimination, uh, there is a danger if we have fintech doing at the same time replicating some of the, some of the human bias that we see in the data, together with uh, perhaps unwillingly creating proxies for group membership that used to be regulated. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And actually, um, I would like to pick up on the last point that um, Tomar brought up, which is um, the idea that big data and machine learning um, allows financial service companies to do a much better job on the positive side to um, uh, personalize um, and target financial products and services to the needs and the preferences of customers. Um, but on the maybe more questionable or concerning side is that it has, we have seen that it actually also allows firms um, to model people's behavioral biases, their financial sophistication more. And I want to talk a bit about what this can do to access to finance in general um, and then also to financial stability. Um, because in particular, um, I, I will draw on some of the work that I have done and um, I've done with my co-author Hong Ru and also as part of the work I'm doing with Ideas42, which is a non-profit that I, fund, um, I founded um, that takes uh, behavioral economics um, to look at um, social problems like financial um, access to financial services. And, and what I want to highlight um, is that um, those behavioral biases can really create new cha or, and the, 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 the ability of financial service firms to, to better model and better exploit these services um, can lead to financial stability issues and potentially even changes in monetary policy. In fact, in the pass-through and the eff efficacy of monetary policy to different parts of the population. So let me give you a, a bit more background in how I'm thinking of this. So um, I draw on some of my earlier work. This is kind of, as I said, this is based on uh, the, the US credit card market, but we've seen some similar issues actually in, in private loans um, and you know, other financial services. And, and the idea here is that um, credit card companies we, we show in our work target consumers based on their financial sophistication and their education level. Very similar to, to what Tomar was saying, it's the power of this new and much more granular data that allows firms actually do, to track not just your kind of characteristics but also how you interact with financial services in the past and from this actually model your potential sophistication much better. Now, Based on that data, they are then able to actually tailor and target financial products differentially to these different groups. Um, and we show that you know, this is definitely happening in the data, just to give you, a, you know, one example from, from our earlier work. So we find that less educated and financially so less sophisticated customers actually are offered credit cards that have much more backloaded terms, meaning they are paying less upfront in, say, annual fees or regular APR, and much more through late fees over limit fees, um, you know, kind of penalty APRs. And that's, you see, this is basically showing you um, the first two things on the left are, you know, kind of these backloaded fees or examples of those backloaded fees that actually decrease with your education level while the upfront fees, like annual fees, increase with your education level. Now, um, we are able to also then use very fine-grained data on the actual design of credit card offers to show that those more backloaded features um, tend to also be communicated on the offer letter in a more shrouded and complex way. So, you know, I don't want to go through like a lot of hedonic regressions here, but just one example is we can show that the complexity of the language used um, in the offers that are provided to less educated people is actually higher. That's why you see, you know, kind of say education level five here are the most educated people. For them actually, um, you know, we find that in the kind of pages of the offer letter where the um, most important information is conveyed, the, the um, ease of reading or the complexity of the language is lower than for less educated people, right? Which again then would suggest that um, these type of features of the credit card um, are being shrouded, are being made less accessible to customers. So, you know, on its face value, at the first um, pass, it shows us that actually big data has the power to allow financial service companies um, to target specific um, behavioral biases um, and extract rents from customers in a different way. 
Now, you could say, you know, as, as Tomá was saying, um, it, the overall level effect could still mean that, you know, po even poorer or less educated people have more access to finance, but there's a differential effect, right, between the, the more educated and the less educated. Why we should be a bit more worried than just worrying, you know, and, and that's by itself already um, a, a big thing, right, um, just worrying about the distributional effects is that we can also see in our data data, and there's definitely room for doing way more work on this, is that firms, um, financial service firms, um, are definitely aware of the fact that there is an interaction between this kind of rent extraction through the type of um, uh, product um, design that you're offering customers and the potential risk that they are uploading, if you want, on the firm. So what I mean with this is think about, you know, I was just showing you that for less educated people, um, financial service firms seem to shroud, um, you know, co the cost of the card more by making them more backloaded. So you pay them later, you pay them when you, ha you know, either are overdrawing or when you have a late fee. Um, which might, however, also mean that you're attracting customers who are, f who are not understanding the true cost of capital, um, therefore maybe are overusing credit relative to their payment capacity, and therefore might ultimately actually have a higher default risk. Um, one way how we showed this in our work is that we can see that when there are exogenous shocks to the riskiness of certain subparts of the population, um, so here we, we model this by looking at um, state level shocks to the unemployment insurance levels of different states, which should make different parts of the population less risky, especially less educated and poorer people, and we indeed find that when these types of, uh, these parts of the population um, are becoming slightly less risky because um, of the unemployment insurance shock, we actually are finding that banks are willing to use these backloaded and shrouded um, uh, payment features much more for these parts of the population, right? So this is saying the banks themselves seem to understand that there is an interaction between how much I shroud and backload features of, um, of a product and the type of credit risk I'm taking on. Now here we did this kind of in a steady state where there was no change in the competitiveness of the market, you know, at, at this point in time. If you think that, you know, kind of say with more competition, this could actually lead to banks taking on a more risk, potentially more risk than, than they might be um, ultimately able to bear. Right? And the final thing I want to say, if you think about, again, of this targeting of different type of, um, of fee structures to different parts of the population, especially if we take into account that these backloaded fees might um, obscure to the part of the population that is targeted by them, the true cost of credit, this might even have an impact on how monetary policy passes through to different parts of the population, right? So the idea here is that um, if more sophisticated, more educated people are charged much more with upfront free fees and transparent fees, um, any change in monetary policy might be passed through quite directly and immediately to them, while um, parts of the population's population that are targeted with these, you know, more behaviorally informed fee structures might not understand immediately the change in the cost of capital and therefore react much later, right? They react only when they actually hit with over limit fees, um, you know, kind of late fees, penalty APRs and so on. And we show, you know, kind of that indeed it is, there is a big difference or an asymmetry in how, say, shocks to the Fed fund rate are passed through to different parts of the population. I don't want to bore you with this, but if you look at this interaction effect here, right, the low educated population um, you know, we interact this with shocks to the Fed fund rate, and you see that for less educated parts of the population, annual fees, for example, and just even the API itself reacts much less. That's why, you know, the negative 
um, coefficient while the backloaded parts of the card, like the late fees, the over limit fees, the default API, and so on, right, they react much more. And so that's exactly what I was trying to say, right, which is that you see this big asymmetry. Um, how different parts of the population might even um, be affected by monetary policy. All right, so in the last minute that I have, right, then I want to think about, you know, what, what does this actually mean for, for regulation? And in particular, what I want to, what, what, you know, kind of I am quite concerned about is that given the multidimensionality and the complexity in which this type of targeting and, and all the different channels that financial service firms have at their disposal, it actually makes um, consumer financial protection quite difficult. And one example that we have seen for ex uh, is that when you look at the credit card market, the Card Act of 2009 was exactly to de designed to stem and curtail some of this differential targeting by eliminating over limit, overdraft fees, reducing late fees and, and um, you know, penalty APAs, et cetera. But what we can show in our data is actually that in response to these constraints, it is true that banks abided by them and they cut over limit fees and they kind of reduced late fees, but they found different ways of bringing that type of backloading um, back into kind of their financial products, this time actually by using introductory zero APRs and making them very visible to this part of the population and then backloading, say, the regular APR. So, you know, um, this is just to, to give you a sense that, you know, I, I, that's why I say regulation by whack-a-mole, but it really means that if you want to do a good job in consumer financial protection and also, you know, with it stabilizing financial markets, we need regulators that are sophisticated enough to understand the complexity of consumer, the consumer financial model and to monitor what's going on in, in this market. Um, so finally, right, um, as I said, this fluidity and the multidimensionality of these targeting tools that fintechs, banks, etc., have as their disposal means there's a dynamic regulatory channel and we should make sure that our regulators actually have the human capital muscle um, to follow the, the, private, um, the private market without, of course, stifling innovation and, and the dynamic of the private uh, market. Um, and let me say one final thing where I feel, you know, kind of this is really very relevant is that um, Hyn was saying this at the beginning, we actually are now facing in a financial sector, especially in, through fintech, where we have very different players that have, in a way, very different financial um, data use muscle. What I mean with this is that if you think about, right, our banking system comes out of a regular environment where there were lots of restrictions and how private data was able to be used to be shared, um, even shared across parts of the bank. At the, on the other end of the extreme, right, we have tech companies and, and consumer um, companies that face none of these constraints. Um, because of it, have been investing much more in the usage of data, in the modeling of consumer choices, and have faced much fewer constraints um, right, in how they can share data, how they can commercialize data. And, and for you know, the BIS and other regulators, right, that means really thinking about when we want to encourage competition, we need to also make sure that we level the playing field in the usage of data, not just letting new players in, but being sure that they actually, um, you know, have access to the same type of, um, you know, human capital to compete um, without creating disruptions. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me here. So I think we've already touched on a lot of the themes I want to maybe elaborate on um, today. So one thing just to start out with is to pause and think about what an amazing moment we're at in terms of the ability we have to use technology to improve the efficiency and reduce the cost of financial services. And ultimately, if we don't end up with very low cost financial services, um, we will have failed uh, because in some sense a lot of these things you know they they used to be legitimately expensive and now they're not um, and really there's a question of how quickly we'll get there how quickly we can expand access 
but what we, what we can basically do is eliminate a tax on all global commerce. And if you think about the magnitude of that opportunity, um, it's probably bigger than most things that, that we could spend our time on. And then uh, another point to just highlight at the start is how important it's going to be to create a brand new regulatory muscle. Um, and it's really quite different to regulate human processes um, and take a legalistic perspective than it is to regulate software and automated optimized processes. So that's also going to be our collective responsibility, really, to educate the next generation of regulators to set up new institutions that have enough regulatory muscle to understand what they're regulating, to test, to do experiments, to do surveys, um, and, and actually be able to take a stand on what's beneficial for consumers and what is not. If the private sector becomes sort of automated and optimized, that can make it very difficult to keep up from the regulatory side. Now, at the same time, the opportunity is just enormous. The fact that we can basically deliver to people at very little cost um, financial education, financial products, we can help people manage their financial health, we can develop relationships with people and have access to information about their lives and, and help them manage their lives, help them access government benefits, help them avoid fees and mistakes. That's just an enormous opportunity. And so also, I would say going forward, we're collectively going to want to be building things more than we did in the past, um, really creating new products. And an ex exciting thing is because they're digital products, even as academics, we can do that. And that's something that I have a, a lab at Stanford where, and collaborating with organizations like Ideas42 and others, really trying to take this technology into people's lives. So let me start by then, I'm going to elaborate on those points. Um, when we think about artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, and financial regulation, a first insight is, or observation is just that large financial institutions are currently plagued by inefficiency. There's a very large share of things that they do that are just people copying things from one database to another. There are people trying to cobble together ineffective systems. So if you could re-architect these things from the ground up, you would have a dramatically fewer people and a lot more software, and they would be dramatically more efficient. And actually, sometimes people worry that some, that I'm going to talk about how regulation gets in the way of that. But ultimately, the end state is actually much easier to regulate in a lot of ways because it's automated and we don't have human mistakes. But it's, we're going to have a long time to get there with the legacy institutions because they have these, these legacy systems. Their, their software is incredibly fragile. They don't know how it works. You talk to their IT people, and literally they're afraid to change things because the whole thing might break. And so what happens in practice is that they work with different business-to-business -business fintechs, not the ones that you see as a consumer, that try to create additional products that plug into their legacy systems to try to add functionality. High quality software architecture in born today tech firms is modular, you use a lot of software as a service, you don't reinvent the wheel, the different components can be modified, tested, and pulled apart in different ways, but it's going to be very hard for the legacy institutions to get there. Their execution is poor and they're very expensive. So the most likely path forward for the firms that survive is a mix of internal innovation and business to business fintechs. But we, we should expect that some of these things may not survive, and that's maybe a good thing, because it's just too hard to fix those existing systems. And the cost advantages of having more modern software are, are so great. Now, the big point, though, I, and this is like not rocket science here, is that the regulation is actually not designed for the AI ML innovation. Um, and I'll expand on that some. This is something that um, there's a lot of research going on in the background, but I, I'll highlight some of the problems it's, it's addressing. Um, the general, the traditional regulation is about human processes and compliance. So you say, are you following these steps? And if something goes wrong, a regulator comes in and checks if you followed the steps. Um, there's, there, this is, there's not cost-benefit analysis there. When you move to a software-driven system, and it's you know AI, ML, digitization, optimization, 
Um, you, first thing is that your decisions and trade-offs are codified in software. So if you think from a, the, a contracting framework, you know, we had things that were not observable to the regulator and not contractable, um, and now they're codified. Now, that seems like a good thing, but for, to firms, that can actually be an impediment because now th they, things are codified, and they worry that three or four years later, the regulators may come back and criticize their decisions when today there's no guidance about what they should be doing. And just a small anecdote about that, suppose a bank is doing customer segmentation, they use unsupervised learning, they just put people into groups, they find one of their segments are you know, alcoholics or you know, gambling addicts. Um, and then what do they do with that? You know, do we, that's really a societal question. Do we as society want banks to do something about the alcoholics they discover um, or not? We don't actually have agreement about that right now. But later, somebody may be upset about the decisions that you made when you did this analysis and identified things. But yet the banks are not prepared to actually take action on this. Um, they don't have the expertise to do anything with this information, but they can't help discovering it. And now it's written down and coded forever that they discovered this and either acted or didn't or failed to act. Um, the, the algorithms require objectives, so you have to codify what it is you're optimizing. And every machine learning algorithm has demonstrable errors. Um, they're trained to minimize error, and so you can't train them without calculating an error, but errors are often not allowed in parts of the financial system. So we have to have a, a system that understands the cost-benefit analysis. So on the one hand, you'd say, well, this is kind of obvious, duh, you know, we should have cost-benefit analysis, and we should um, then therefore recognize that humans make errors too and compare error rates. And we should obviously use this much more often than we probably are today. At the same time, not so fast, because we've actually seen in things like, you know, the Facebook and the election and things like that, that when we as a society haven't figured out what our preferences are, and when we as a research community have not figured out what it means to have safe machine learning, um, unbiased machine learning, interpretable machine learning, stable machine learning, machine learning that is robust against antagonistic players, um, people who are trying to manipulate fraudsters, cyber hackers, and so on. If we don't know what that means, and we don't today, we haven't agreed on what all that means, then, you know, Yes, the, it's, we shouldn't not use machine learning because uh, it has errors, okay? That's a bad reason not to use it, but we shouldn't just go and use it when we haven't figured out how to make it safe. And so that's really one of the big research agendas that we have to complete. We need to, to in order to get these benefits, we need to change the framework and then figure out how to implement it, and that, that, that needs to be done. One other observation I'll make is that actually, in the world of software and machine learning, the problem faced by the top management of a firm or its board is very similar to that faced by a regulator. They are delegating to teams of machine learning scientists and, and, and groups of software engineers who are building things. The people at the top also don't understand what they're building. And in fact, the people building the stuff don't understand what they're building. They're taking you know, an off-the-shelf black box without a framework for how to evaluate how it works, why it works, or what its limitations would be. And so the problem of the managers of regulating inside the firm is very similar to the regulator. And in a lot of my advising of tech firms, what, what, what they need help with is how to regulate themselves internally. Um, and, and it's not that they're just being um, malicious, they, they literally don't know the answers. Now there's some cases where they have bad incentives and they are malicious, but even in the cases where they're not, it's still actually hard to do. Um, a few recommendations or things to think about. Um, there's really a lot of public good provision we're talking about here. One thing that you observe when you look across industries is there's a huge amount of duplicated investments across firms in different areas. Cybersecurity and fraud, often around identity, um, audit. All of these things are services that are duplicated by firms around the world. The efficient industry structure probably has a few, more than one, but a few at scale service providers who are both regulated and subsidized. And how you subsidize them, maybe you tax the industry and put it back in, maybe you know, it's a general government subsidy. But in the end, um, there's huge externalities from cybersecurity and fraud. And one of the big barriers to entry from firm, for firms is just building the capability to protect themselves. There's an enormous amount of time and energy and investment in trying to do that.
Um, one other clear, um, but obvious but important thing is that identity services are a very important public good. If you have reasonable identity services, then there's no reason to hack into a system to get your social security number if that social security number is not enough to commit financial fraud with. Um, if you can tell, we spend all this effort regulating, um, you know, opening of bank accounts, but yet today, if someone opens a new bank account and steals money and transfers money into it, if it's less than ten or twenty thousand dollars, basically nothing happens to them. So we have this whole infrastructure to prevent terrorism and so on, but we actually aren't stopping people from committing fraud on a on a fairly large scale. So if we could just make our system more sensible, um, we would actually save enormous costs. So finally, just getting guidelines that reduce regulatory uncertainty is also very important, making sure we, we know what the rules of the road are so people can innovate. Now let me turn to talk a bit about competition. Um, of course, competition is key for some types of innovation. Regulation can raise barriers to entry. Um, there's a claim that regulation makes it hard to innovate. I think that's sometimes true, but it's also true that the more efficient processes reduce the burden of regulatory compliance. Um, for example, you know, when you move money internationally, the money hops through all these different correspondence banks, it gets lost, it gets stuck, so it's very expensive to do compliance. Five percent of wires fail. You have to spend all this money and time trying to chase these things down. If the money just went end to end instantly, then you wouldn't have to incur that regulatory burden of compliance of chasing down things that fail because they wouldn't fail and you wouldn't have information traveling from one place to the other. My observation is that com consumer benefits and competition are often lost on regulators. Um, insurance are often focused on solving frictions, reducing fees, expanding access, and improving financial health. They're trying to exploit the fact that everybody hates their financial institutions because their financial institutions are trying to rip them off. Um, and the entrants are, are then trying to compete on, on quality in many cases. But it's, it's often, uh, there's, there's, there's very little cost benefit in the regulation um, coming in. Instead, the regulations support large scale firms that have the ability to deal with compliance. And they often also will promote vertical and horizontal integration, which harms competition. So I'm going to use an example here from the ad tech space where I've spent quite a bit of time, and that's privacy regulation. If you look at privacy, consumers actually have a very hard time expressing their preferences about privacy because it's, it's actually a pretty intangible thing of why, why do you feel bad if a computer is seeing your information. There's real economic things like security risks, but it's more than that, but it's hard for cons to even elicit consumer preferences about that. But more generally, consumers fear powerless, and they don't make choices to protect privacy. So if they have to incur a little bit of a cost to get more privacy, switch services, switch email providers, something like that, they, they won't do it. And that creates very little incentive for firms to do a better job. But then we get a regulatory response that generally creates frictions for entrants and supports the market power of incumbents. For example, privacy regulations that say it's, it's much better to share data across products within a firm than it is to share across a firm are, of course, going to create incentives for mergers. So from this perspective, it's better, I don't think it's better, but by regulatory uh, fiat, it's better for privacy that a single firm creates a super profile of you that includes your location, knows if you take your, your phone to the bathroom and back while you're watching TV, knows your physical telemetry, how you drive, all your web and mobile activity, what videos you watch, into a super profile. That's better from a privacy perspective than having any information sharing across firms. That's obviously um, problematic from a, from a policy perspective, but that's the kind of regulations that we've been writing in this area. Um, then once, it, once you have these super profiles, of course, that's a barrier to entry. It makes it easier to provide services, um, and, and more, there's an efficiency aspect to that, which then makes it hard for any individual firm to compete, and it then destroys the, the market incentives to, um, to compete for privacy. By the way, a lot of this I'm talking about, you can write down simple models of this, but there's not really good models of all of this. So this is, good, this is sort of good research um, topics. Then on platforms, platforms often have market power. That's an observation. People get confused, though. People talk a lot about how it's the data that's creating the market power. Data is quite complicated. Some data, lots of people have access to, and so there's not a market power benefit from having that data. What really gives you power as a platform is control over consumers' attention. The fact that, say, when you go to a phone, that the phone controls what apps you can see and what services you can use. If you go to a search engine, it directs which way you go. 
Um, if you go to maps, it, it determines what you see. So those types of competitive bottlenecks, as you call it in the two-sided market literature, those are the sources of market power. Data supports that market power. Collecting data helps you provide services, it helps you attract consumers, but it's not the data itself that's the problem, it's the access, the bottlenecks, and the use of that consumer attention. When you have the consumer attention and you have a bottleneck, then you're able to charge for access to the consumers, or if you want to enter with your own service, you can direct consumers to that service. Now, if the service you're directing a consumer to is in a competitive market, it's not a problem to have vertical integration that can be efficient. But if the downstream market is something that has its own scale economies, like many services have, digital services, then it is a big problem for um, competition. So generally in the financial services space, we can think the platform aggregates consumers and charges for access and makes the financial institutions into dumb pipes. And we think about, well, do the, do, the, do the big techs want to be banks? Well, they don't want all the headache of being a bank, but they don't care about that if they can get all the profits and just have the banks provide services at constant marginal, at, the, at marginal cost, basically. So that, I think, is more of the strategy for these big tech firms. If you have access to the consumer's attention, you can auction off the right to serve that consumer. You can direct traffic to one provider versus another and suck out the surplus from yourself. You don't need to integrate. They typically are going to want to integrate in these things like putting payments on social networks when it's something that's more embedded in the product and where you would have sort of a, a problem of asset specificity and incomplete contracting and hold up where you would worry about being too dependent on one large partner. That's why one reason you don't see vertical integration there. A case study of how this platform economics work, a lot of you probably know about credit card economics. In credit card economics, the credit card platform con contracts make sure the fees aren't passed on to the decision maker, who's the consumer. The consumer gets bribed to choose the credit card payment over cash. After aggregating consumers, the credit card provider charges high merchant fees to the merchants, and actually competition doesn't help. It can even make things worse. There's a nice QJE paper by Ben Edelman and, and Wright in 2015. So those economics have made, it, have made credit cards very profitable across countries and over time. Now we come along with the new thing, Apple Pay. So in Apple Pay, the NFC radio is what you use to make these mobile payments. Um, Apple has locked down access to the NFC radio, so you don't get access to the NFC radio, like say in a banking app, you, a banking app cannot get access to the NFC radio. Only Apple Pay can access the NFC radio on the iPhone. Um, consumers don't switch phones because they're, they're Chase Visa is not in the Apple wallet. They, they, they use lots of services on the phone. They're not gonna switch the phone just over a credit card. They can just, they'd rather switch credit cards than switch phones. So as a result of that, um, Apple is able to charge very high fees you know, on the same order as the Visa and MasterCard network interchange fees, 0.15% of, of all transaction volume goes to Apple, and those are not allowed by contract to be passed on to the consumer um, and that has the same credit card economics, but now we've extracted the profits away from the credit cards and put them in Apple's pocket. Okay? They, they just took the credit card game and worked it for themselves. So now they get the profits. Well, wh what are we going to do about this? Um, I think hoping competition works is not a good answer there. We've seen that that's failed with credit cards already, and so this is going to probably be something where we just directly regulate those fees. Um, but right now, there's not that much movement in that direction. People have been very slow on this. Um, on this, but it, I think it also illustrates that the tech companies have a form of, of power that is quite substantial. You know, they can, they can extract surplus out of other tech companies too. They can extract surplus out of Amazon because Amazon wants to reach you through the phone. So having access to the consumers and being able to lock them down allows you to suck out all the profits. Um, finally, I'm just going to set up a topic that maybe we can talk about more uh, later and that's digital currency. We haven't, none, nobody's touched on that yet. I'm just going to focus on one little aspect of it, which is international payments. So international payments, and in some cases domestic payments, obviously have large potential for efficiency improvements. We still don't have instant payments for a lot of consumers in the U.S., although we're getting closer. We still have you know, delays of a couple of days if I want to move money from Fidelity to Bank of America. If I don't pay them 20 bucks, I'd, I have to wait a couple of days to get access to my funds. You know, this is so like you know, 20th century. I mean, we're like a fifth of the way into the 21st century. Let's get over it. You know, I should have access to my funds. Like, they can move it. It's, we're, in, you know, we're in a developed country, guys. But we, instead, we have these incredible inefficiencies. And the problems, there's this whole array of problems. One of them is market power. And when we're moving money internationally, money moves through a hub-and-spoke system. And the largest um, money center banks are hubs in the hub-and-spoke system. 
they can give good rates to their biggest customers, but they charge high markups to smaller customers in smaller countries. The network effects of the existing system create a barrier to entry, and the incumbents benefit from the frictions and the fees. Regulators have traditionally focused on the risk rather than the welfare, the, both the consumer welfare and the costs incurred by business customers. So, you know, if you think about the, using cryptocurrency for international payments, if you don't like it, you should, regulators should look at themselves, like, why didn't you fix the system? And instead, you've left this system that, that has high fees, high delays, and high inefficiencies. And of course, somebody's going to come in and try to, um, try to improve upon that. Generally, the status quo is incredibly regressive and a huge tax on co global commerce. It hurts poor countries, small countries, and small businesses, small banks the most. The ideal system should be 24-7, instant. Funds should either reach their destination or be returned to the sender. You should have two-way communication to verify the information so you don't send funds if they don't want to receive it. You should have efficient liquidity, um, efficient exchange sourcing of liquidity between different currencies for small and large customers and low margins. That's what the world should look like. And if, you know, if we don't build it, um, some other, other firms, private sector organizations of different types will, will build it because the technology exists to make that happen. Um, and the real question is just how quickly do, can, if, if you have a certain set of desiderata, how quickly can we get there? What's the best structure? But in, we're not going to get that system through competition unless somebody provides a lower cost service that creates the competition. So I think a big benefit of this cryptocurrency movement has been that it's gotten everybody off their butts to think about how do we actually get to the this, this, this state of affairs that we should have gotten to long ago. Thank you. That's great. Um, thank you, Susan. So what I'll do is, uh, you know, at the risk of oversimplification, what I'm going to do is <clears throat> just go over a few of the themes and maybe uh, just tee up a few uh, sort of salient questions for us, to, uh, you know, for us to focus on. And what I'll do is I'll just draw on some work that uh, we did at the BIS in our annual economic report um, last year. So one, one thing that has come up is this idea that uh, uh, fintechs and big techs in particular are different um, from in, in the sense that um, uh, you know, they, their business model relies on the interaction of a large number of users and the data that, that, that it generates is uh, an indispensable you know, byproduct of their business model. But then the data generates these network effects which then elicits uh, a lot more activity among the network members which then leads uh, to even, even more data and, and uh, Tomah has a uh, paper of, uh, uh, you know, with this kind of a theme in mind where the data is a byproduct of the, uh, of the activities. Now, this kind, of, um, this kind of framework actually does generate a lot of opportunities. So think of financial inclusion. Now, uh, imagine that um, you're feeding a name into a black box and the black box has a red light and a green light. Uh, if the red light goes, o um, goes on, uh, you know, this is a bad borrow and you say no. If the green light goes on, it's a good borrow and you say, and you say yes. Now, of course, uh, it's not going to be perfect, but suppose that you actually had a chance to uh, back test how, how good this uh, black box was. And suppose that you measure on the vertical axis the proportion of good borrowers uh, that actually got the green light. So those um, uh, signals that, that actually turned out to be right on the horizontal axis uh, imagine that uh, this is the proportion of the, of the bad borrowers who nevertheless got a green light. So it, it, was, it was an incorrect green light. Now, you can sort of dial up, um, you can dial up and down the frequency of the green light. Uh, and if it's a completely um, uninformative uh, black box, uh, you would just get a green light, um, you know, whether the borrower is good or bad, uh, and you would get this 45 degree line. Uh, so it's a completely uninformative uh, black box, if you like. The perfect uh, discriminating black box would be one where you only get green lights for the, for the good borrowers, and you have a red light for all the bad borrowers. And in, and, and in general, the, uh, the further you, you move up, um, the higher is the accuracy. Now, what I want to do is to, um, is to give you an example that we reported in the annual economic report, uh, and this draws on some joint work that I did with Leonardo Gambacorta and Yi Huang, uh, John Frost, and Paolo Zvenden. Um, and Paolo Zvenden comes from this fintech firm called Mercado Libre, which operates in Latin America. 
And this, this, um, this yellow line here is the, uh, is the pattern what you, uh, you know, that you get when you dial up and down the, the frequency of the green light. And uh, what you see there is definitely it's above the 45 degree line, so it's, a, it's definitely better than, a, uh, than just a random noise. But if you also um, were to use their, uh, their big data machine learning um, information, then you would actually do even better than the pure, uh, the, uh, just a credit bureau score. So you can actually do better in this way. You're a better discriminant um, for, uh, for the good borrowers. Now, one of the consequences of this kind of finding would be that you can extend credit to a, large, to a larger number of uh, potential borrowers, and therefore you can expand financial services. If the borrower in particular comes from uh, a region that's unbanked or the borrower lacks documentation, lacks collateral, then you can actually go and uh, um, uh, you know, use these techniques to actually extend, um, extend services further. One interpretation of why you, you, know, you can do better with the, uh, with, the, um, uh, with the machine learning algorithm is that you have the full network information. So not only do you have access to the information of the borrower and the borrower's characteristics, you actually know who the borrower interacts with. So it's like judging the character of someone by judging the character of their friends. So who do you hang out with? So what are the interactions? And this is the kind of thing that uh, if you run an e-commerce platform, you can, you can certainly uh, uh, get a much better uh, sense of. Now, uh, Antoinette mentioned monetary policy. And one thing that uh, comes up is that uh, uh, if you can use this kind of big data, you may be able to uh, liberate yourself from uh, the reliance on collateral. So one of the results that, um, that we find in some ongoing work is that if you look at the, so, and, and this is for China, we had, um, uh, uh, you know, there's some ongoing work on, on China, uh, is that uh, the elasticity of credit with respect to house prices um, is very different depending on whether it's bank lending or whether it's big tech lending. So on the left hand, uh, so the left hand column, uh, this is the traditional association you would find between uh, the elasticity of credit and house prices. But um, uh, on the right hand side, this, this is the coefficient that we, it's still positive, but uh, it, uh, yeah, um, it is far less strong and it turns out to be uh, statistically, statistically insignificant. And I think one of the things that, that uh, this kind of finding raises is how robust are these findings? Now, one thing that uh, we were able to do, and this is from the same paper, this is uh, uh, Leonardo de Gamba Corta, Yi Huang, um, I'm sorry, this is Yi Ping Huang and, uh, uh, and Han Chu. What, what we find is we can actually uh, track the time series of the area under the curve. So I mentioned you know, these curves. If you were to take the integral under the curve, um, that's, uh, that's a uh, you know, useful summary statistic of how good uh, this kind of uh, device is for discriminating good and bad borrowers. It's a number between uh, 0.5 and 1. And um, one thing that really uh, is quite striking um, is that uh, when China introduced restrictions on big tech uh, and on shadow banking products at the end of 2017, we saw this quite sharp drop in, um, in uh, credit. But if we look at the, the area under the curve calculation, it turns out to move around as well. So uh, it's not a constant. It actually depends on uh, the input that's, uh, that's uh, put into the black box, and it depends on the, uh, on the economic circumstances at the time. And when uh, the area under the curve calculation was already declining before these restrictions were put in, but then they continued to decline, which um, suggests that as conditions tighten, uh, the, the uh, big data machine learning type uh, calculations were not uh, as good as they were before. But one thing which really does come out is, nevertheless, you're still better off uh, using these new techniques than simply relying on the traditional uh, um, the balance sheet based measures of credit worthiness. So the blue one is traditional information. The yellow is the, um, uh, is the area under the curve if you were to use a statistical model, but uh, throwing in a lot more variables. The red 
is um, the particular discriminant model that uh, this particular big tech was, uh, was actually using. Yes, it's falling, but it uh, does better than the, uh, than the uh, traditional, traditional information. So in the introduction, uh, you know, I mentioned that uh, some of the policy issues, they straddle the traditional policy issues to do with financial stability and consumer protection, but also there are new issues that are raised, in particular to do with competition and with data privacy. And uh, in the category of traditional concerns, one thing uh, that uh, has come up in the policy discussion is if the big techs and uh, the money market funds that they run are uh, holding other financial cl uh, claims in the financial system, what are the general criminal effects? What are the, what are the systemic effects that that generates? Now, this chart um, shows you the assets uh, that are held by the money market funds of the Chinese big techs. And what you see is that the pink bars are pretty big, and these are short-term bank deposits. And uh, to the extent that uh, uh, you know, if, if, if there were a, uh, a rapid, uh, you know, a, a rapid uh, redemption shock, uh, it could transmit the shock to the banking system as well if uh, you know, there is uh, you know, disruption to the deposit funding to the banks. And perhaps for this reason, uh, more and more regulations have been put in. Um, so one set of regulations have been on the, on the limits to instant redemptions of the money market funds. Uh, there's also been the central clearing requirement for the, um, for the big payments firms, but also uh, the idea that um, uh, you, know, you need to have very high uh, reserve requirements for these, for these uh, uh, payment firms as well. These are traditional financial stability concerns uh, that are being adapted to apply to the, uh, to the new entrants. But there are, of course, you know, new challenges because um, there's the issue of, uh, so, so one issue is the, is the traditional concern between, you know, do you, uh, is a concentrated banking sector good for financial stability? Uh, you know, one argument for saying yes is uh, a, profitable, a profitable banking sector is able to, you know, build equity and the profitable banking sector also has a high franchise value, which will, uh, which will uh, tend to promote more you know, prudent um, business activities on the part of the banks. On the other hand, you know, we have competition. Uh, other things being equal, a, a more competitive industry is better for welfare. The, but there are two other dimensions to this. One is the privacy financial regulation dimension. And then number two here is, is also the um, is also important, which is the efficiency and, and privacy dimension as well. And let me just conclude with one diagrammatic device that uh, uh, we used in our annual economic report. It's not the only way of doing it, but I think it's a good way, I find it a good way just to focus some of the, some of the discussions. Imagine that we um, have, so, th so this is what we call the regulatory compass. And um, uh, imagine that one dimension um, measures the degree to which your uh, policies are designed to promote new entry, which is going north, new market entry, or to restrict entry, which is to go the other direction. And another dimension would be to, um, is how you deal with data. So if you go east, this is, if you like, a more decentralized solution. So you, you endow property rights of your, of your own data. You allow individuals to uh, you know, do with their data what they wish. So it's more of a Kosian solution. Uh, and the hope is that if you give data rights to individuals and they can use their data in an uh, enlightened way, this is going to um, uh, create a more level playing field. The other direction is to say, well, it's, it's a more paternalistic attitude saying, look, you know, there are limits to how, how much you can do this. Uh, it's just better to put walls and limits, uh, walls and limits on, on the use of data. And if you sort of plot it in this, in this two-dimensional diagram, I think some of the things that we associate with this, um, uh, you know, the, the new dimension of competition. So, you know, uh, to, the, to the extent that we now have um, financial stability issues commingling with uh, competition issues, we may um, uh, have to address both at the same time. So to the extent that uh, open banking and the various provisions of uh, of open banking where you uh, mandate the, the sharing of data uh, to approved uh, players 
Um, you know, this is a way of promoting competition and promoting entry, so this is on the top half of the compass. But also it's um, by giving um, the, the, uh, the discretion to individuals on how they use their data or how they can actually make their data available, it's also uh, going towards the more decentralized COSIAN solution. And there are elements of uh, the European Union's um, General Data Protection Regulations, GDPR, which also have that feature. On the other hand, there are also features of the same set of rules that go in the other direction. So, you know, open banking restricts uh, the way that, uh, uh, or restricts the, um, the recipients of this kind of data to approved uh, uh, players only. So that's a kind of, you know, that's, that's going, um, uh, going in the bottom half of the compass. But also it's a way of restricting the use of data as well. So even within the same body of rules, you can actually have pieces that go in the, in the northeast direction as well as the southwest direction. And it may be that uh, this is one way we can think about um, trying to, uh, to level the competitive playing field uh, by sprinkling suitable sort of grains of sand in the excessively you know, well-oiled machine of this data network activities loop. And I think this is where the theory of the second best might be, might be you know, quite, quite useful. And, if you read the chapter, we also discuss other, um, you know, other uh, initiatives uh, in around the world. I think one very thorny issue, which, uh, which uh, Susan also mentioned, was that uh, different actors are in charge of different regulations. Now, we have three sets of players involved here. We have the traditional financial stability regulators, so central banks, uh, supervisory agencies, and so on. But then we have the competition authorities, and competition authorities and the traditional financial stability regulators haven't always seen eye to eye. So for example, on the, uh, on the concentrated banking sector question, um, quite often there's been a disagreement between these two groups. But then into this mix, we also have the data privacy regulators. And here, the, um, sometimes the data privacy regulators apply a set of criteria that are not, if you like, in, you know, that there are not, um, uh, purely about the ways and means. Are they, uh, there's a very strong sense that there are some uh, privacy issues that are beyond economic trade-offs, that, uh, that they very much have the attributes of fundamental rights. And in this, um, in this regulatory compass, what I've done here is to uh, plot the dots in different colors depending on who was responsible for bringing in these regulations. You have uh, the financial regulators in blue, the competition authorities in green and the data privacy uh, regulators in, in red. And uh, as Susan was saying, unless you actually have a joined up response, it's not clear that you're gonna get the optimal response. And, and nor is it gonna be obvious how you can reconcile this view that data privacy uh, has attributes of a fundamental right uh, versus someone who applies an economic reasoning, so you know, everything is subject to trade-offs and it's all a matter of the price. And I think that discussion is just getting going. And I think this is one area where, uh, you know, as policymakers uh, and as academics, we, uh, you know, we can contribute a lot by, by clarifying the thinking. And let me perhaps, you know, uh, also just spark the next round of conversation by following up on Susan's comment about digital currencies and cross-border uh, payments. Uh, I mean, let me just, uh, um, well, first of all, I just want to, uh, you know, open, um, the, the, the table to the other panelists, but also ask them if they can also to think about the issue of uh, what is the scope for uh, the public provision of public goods? In, in a sense that, you know, um, is there a sense in which, uh, you know, some, um, some underlying sort of basic infrastructures, foundational infrastructures are so foundational that it can only be provided by the public sector rather than the private sector? And if that were the case, uh, you know, where do we draw the line? Um, uh, between, uh, you know, cases where it's obvious that it's always the public provision which is optimal versus the, um, uh, versus cases where the, the, uh, the private uh, provision is, is superior. So, um, Thomas, shall I turn to you first and you can just reflect on, on this or any other issue um, you wish. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, uh, so I'm gonna be brief so that we have time for, for questions. 
I don't know. My, my feeling with fintech, honestly, is that um, there is the usual, I think the usual trade-off still applies, essentially. So we know from history that um, when there's a big change, we overestimate the short-term impact, we underestimate the long-term impact. I think that's going to be true there. And also, um, we also tend to overestimate the extent to which um, new technologies are going to change the fundamental economic issues. So the way I think about fintech, if I have to make like a first order statement, I would say it's going to improve efficiency, it's going to probably improve allocations and um, you know, like distributions, subject to huge caveats with um, you know, exploiting bias, behavioral biases like uh, Antoinette was showing, um, and creating more opportunities for discrimination. So I think that's going to be the, the, the level effect. And my guess for financial stability is it's going to do exactly nothing. I think that financial stability pre and post fintech can be exactly the same. I don't think it's going to improve it or make it worse. I think it's going to create exactly the same issues that we've had. I think fintech is going to solve nothing to that one. And I think your graph with the Chinese mutual fund sounds like you know you put your money in the in the in the mutual fund in the money market fund and then the deposit in the bank. But I don't think it changes anything to the fundamental problem of bank stability, for instance. So to a first order, I think that fintech is not going to improve financial stability. And that the fundamental issue of short-term debt, maturity mismatch, is going to change, is going to be the same. Now, that's to a first order. You, perhaps at the margin, in some cases, it's going to change. But if I'm to make a guess, that'd be my guess. So maybe I want to respond to the last thing. Um, I, I think it's true that, you know, obviously, the, the economics um, of financial markets are not are still going to hold. The one area where I worry a lot is cybersecurity, and that, you know, kind of their fintech in a way, um, you can say it's not the financial risk, it's literally the infrastructure risk um, of, of those platforms that now become, you know, more hackable, more, um, you know, kind of uh, open to, to fraud, um, either by, f you know, consumer behavior that opens up um, opportunities, um, for for lapses in cyber security or kind of you know firms uh, sorry banks in particular I would worry that say um, smaller banks uh, financially kind of more constrained banks um, are cutting corners or just don't have the capabilities um, to to provide the same level of, of security so there I think you know is, is a is a potential new risk factor that that we haven't seen before. And then the second thing which, you know, kind of is in addition to what Tomar was saying is, um, you know, this was also the last thing both uh, Susan and, and Hun were f um, hinting at is that um, cyber security, uh, sorry, um, cryptocurrencies um, open up a whole new dimension on, on payments. Um, and I think what we have learned is some of the currently kind of most prominent um, cryptocurrencies like bitcoins um, were or are designed in a flawed way because the, the big flaw that you have in, in uh, these cryptocurrencies is that the incentives of miners all push towards centralization of the mining activity when you wanted to have a distributed, you know, kind of in a way more democratized system of cryptocurrencies. But this is obviously solvable. And here I would you know, kind of with different cryptocurrency designs, and some of them are obviously changing these days. Um, but here I do believe that one has to be very careful because um, I think while I would hope that these new technologies can create massive new opportunities, um, number one, I would be very concerned to create vulnerabilities um, where ultimately the regulator will have to bail out firms that were poorly designed just because a huge amount of consumers have now moved to these platforms without understanding what type of you know kind of services and and uh, they're accessing and their money gets lost in them um, and the other thing that i think we need to be very careful about is that there are tech companies you know, if you think Libra, for example, that have existing networks that they can exploit um, to also deliver um, financial services on, right? And here, um, it's not clear that 
a tech company is also the best provider of financial services, but if you already have an existing captured base of customers, then obviously you know, your entry is much easier. And I think this is the last thing I want to say to this is, you know, I personally would think rather than forcing central banks to providing an alternative platform and being in the business of you know, kind of innovating on, you know, kind of the infrastructure of technology, um, I, I would rather opt for regulation that opens up existing private service, you know, of private infrastructure to more competition and to other um, financial service companies being able to use those platforms, similar to what we've seen in telecommunication, right, and, uh, and industries like that. Yes, so lots of great issues here. It's hard to know what to react to first, but um, maybe on, on the original question that you asked about public versus private, I definitely agree with Antoinette that a lot of these things are better provided by the private sector, um, but ev even like something like SWIFT is a big consortium that, that's made it harder for it to innovate. It, there's lots of reasons that, uh, that you know, a more nimble firm can get there faster. But there's still a big role for regulators in making it easier or harder for firms to adopt new technologies. And I think that, you know, for all of, I don't, we, we don't, this isn't the time and place to get into all of the advantages and disadvantages of cryptocurrency, but I think one of the big advantages has been, again, that it's just sort of pushed people in the direction of saying, wait, why again is it okay for these things to take, you know, 10 days for people to get money to Africa or what other kinds of problems that we have? And, I guess another concern there with, with kind of unintended consequences of regulation is that you know, remittance providers, which part of what Libra was trying to solve is remittances. Um, why are remittances expensive? Well, there's many reasons, and operating retail storefronts and so on is, is a big reason. But re, you know, enter, entering remittance providers can't get a bank account at a, at a big bank because of regulatory risk. So then they go to smaller banks and get less service because those banks pay markups to the big banks. Overall, the remittances are still happening, so your regulatory approach didn't stop the remittances, it just pushed it at arm's length and raised costs. Um, and so at some level, we need to, you, somehow we've like lost sight of the end consumer. We have to say, all right, we're gonna have remittances and we're not gonna have remittances. If we're gonna have remittances, yes, that is risky, but that doesn't mean that it's better to push it onto a small bank that doesn't have the right scale economies and infrastructure to deal with it properly. That's just sort of you know hiding um, from the problem. So I think in the end we've created a lot of these these openings, and then it's not surprising that, that if people can solve the problem with technology, that they come in and try to compete in these openings that were left. But I guess getting back to this this regulatory compass as well, I'd say well part of the, the thing is it used to be an option to just have a concentrated banking structure and let them you know charge high fees and rip off poor consumers and exploit them and be happy with, with their profitability, but that has become less of a viable option because of in the entry and competition from new tech firms. And so maybe we need to rethink the approach and say, all right, well, maybe these fees are gonna go away and we should be, for, if we want stability, we should plan on a future with fewer of these inefficient fees and you know, actually make the cost structure go down <laughs> through automation and improved efficiency um, and, and then approach the, the stability problem head on rather than indirectly in a way that's also very regressive. Um, and so I guess one of my big objections to all of this is just how regressive the kind of status quo has been. Um, on the, on the you know, public-private interaction though, I, I would say I do think it's, it's, it, is, it, doesn't, it's, it is very hard for smaller companies to deal with cybersecurity. And again, the, what's the root of the problem? The, and some of the privacy concerns for that matter too. Why am I so freaked out about people seeing my data? It's because they can actually hurt me with it. And that's just a failure of regulation and, and good public policy. If, if having my social security and birth date doesn't allow you to hurt me, then you know, I, I don't care if it doesn't need to be protected anymore. Um, and so I think identity infrastructure does seem like something that is, makes sense for governments to be involved in because of course governments do generally already have to know who their citizens are, so there's a complementarity there. Um, 
but and then more broadly, of course, the government can't be, well, they have branches of the government, but generally our government is not good at cybersecurity in the non, um, you know, in, uh, military parts of things. But we, we're actually pretty terrible in the regular government. But we can have private providers of services and we can think about, you know, getting compliance by making sure people are using a, a, a provider, a service provider, who actually meets various requirements. And that seems like the efficient industry structure. Yeah, so <clears throat> to me, I, I think it's a bit like, if you think about the, um, it's a bit like airline regulation. Like there is no private market for um, assessing the safety of planes. It's regulated by government. And, and I think the cybersecurity, but, the, but the, the airlines are private. So I think that's kind of the right framework for anything where the, there's real danger. So the process is very complicated. Nobody understands how airplanes actually work. Um, it's life or death. Then the answer is, it, as it turns out, is very strong government oversight and regulation of private companies. I think the day the, what Susan described is, to me, is very similar in the sense that it's way too complete. Knowing what is safe or unsafe in terms of data, privacy, identity, for the individual, the typical um, you know, citizen, it's impossible. It's way too complicated. So what that, and to me, in that world, it's clear that you want very strong oversight by the government to actually put stamps on this is safe, this is not safe. And after that, it's private companies doing it. Um, but I think there the clear, the public good there is to recognize that nobody will ever understand what is safe or unsafe. And people, you can't expect people to understand and be able to make that choice. So the government needs to have a framework to put a stamp on safe versus unsafe. And after that, the private sector can, uh, can do a good job. So I think to me, that's going to be the key public provision of public good. Of course, we can go backwards with that and say, oh, you know, there's a cookie, there's a cookie, there's a cookie, there's a cookie. Click this box, there's a cookie, there's a cookie. <laughs> and like, you know, that, that in, you know, of course, cookies are, they must be evil, they must be poisonous, you know, and, and so that, that when the messaging is completely disconnected from the costs and benefits and also makes people feel helpless and unable to, you know, control their situation. I'm being told something's dangerous, but I can't live my life without it, then that's counterproductive. So and that's partly why we need the research muscle to actually build warnings and inf information provision to consumers that actually is effective. And that's where a lot of the behavioral work, those types of things that Annette has worked on, and, Internet and, and Ideas42 and other places have worked on, to try to actually figure out how do you communicate relevant information to guide consumer choices in more productive directions. Right. Why don't we? Um, why don't we get a few questions from the audience. And uh, let me apologize uh, from the outset that because of the lights, um, I can barely see even the front row. So if I don't recognize you, it's not because, uh, it's not because uh, you know, I'm being lazy. It's, uh, it's because of the lights. So let's see if we can gather a few questions. Yes. So already, I, I cannot see. Yes, yes. go ahead. Yes. Um, go ahead. My question is about uh, discrimination. If, if the existing uh, data, train data, data already has discrimination embedded in it, how do you expect uh, machine learning, learning algorithms to actually improve on that? So the, the question was, how can machine learning improve on human decisions if the data already has human judgment in it? So that's a great question. Actually, we have a session tomorrow about AI and fairness where we're going to have more discussion of that. Um, but w one thing is that I think it's a, it's a very important question. But generally, when, you're, when firms are doing these things, they run experiments. And if, if you know that you're going to build an algorithm like this, you can actually be intentional in your data collection. So that doesn't mean that everyone is doing it today, but the best practice would be that you recognize that you have observational data with certain biases. You can augment your data collection. You can also, um, you can augment by, by bring, gathering different types of data sources. You can reweight your data to make it more representative, and you can do experiments to gather more. Um, at some level, these are, these are more solvable problems uh, than you think when you realize that you have the ability to design your data collection. Yeah, plus remember, like, it could just be that uh, people make mistakes. Like, people have biases that persist over time. And the machine can figure out these biases relatively quickly. Like, if you have, imagine two populations that have the same risk, but for some reason you don't like population B and you put them a higher threshold before you lend to them. 
Okay? So you, like for group number one, you put the cutoff at 10, anybody below, above 10, you land. For group number two, you put the cutoff at 12, anybody above 12, you land, and below 12, you don't. Even though the populations are the same, so you should have the same cutoff, say, of 10 for both. Um, well, with, with some data, after a while, the machine is going to learn that that was a wrong decision, and it's going to put automatically 10 to both. So I think that's, that's one example in which the, the machines are likely to slowly, uh, potentially, but surely, reduce this bias. And let me mention just another example. When, they, when it was called out that the tech firms had like racist image recognition algorithms, they were recognizing brown-skinned people in the 70s and light-skinned people at 97%. Within a year, they had basically equalized the accuracy rates, and all, what they needed to do was augment their, their data sets and do some reweighting. So that was really just an oversight that the engineers weren't looking for that problem, but once they recognized it, it was easier than you think to fix. I think the big problem is that there's things there that you don't, the things that you don't know to look for. So we're gonna continue to create problems that we didn't think to look for, and then there's gonna be a bit of this iterative game of finding the problems and fixing them. Right, and, and you see, what another dimension is that your outcome variables don't need to be biased, right? Because they are just outcomes and they are not filtered through kind of human decisions. Now, of course, if the outcome itself, right, that we measure were human judgments on, you know, kind of say, you know, how well a loan performed, you would be very worried how quickly the machine will learn it. But if the outcome is actually, does the person default or does the person pay back, right, then that bias at least is stopped. And actually, you know, kind of a lot of the improvements, if you look at even, say, in, um, in healthcare, the, the use of AI in healthcare is that the, why often machines do better, right? I'm sure you recently saw, like, you know, kind of cancer screening and so on is better than what doctors do, but it's because actually machines are being fed true outcomes to assess the quality of the decision that the machine made, while the doctor often doesn't go back and really look what happened to that case of that woman or man that are diagnosed, right? And so actually often humans don't get this, or either don't have the time or don't get the same quality of information to update their models um, that we can give to a machine. Yeah, and you can have a taxonomy, basically. Some kinds of AI mimic humans. Right. So, like, you can build an AI to try to make the same decision a loan officer would have made, and then they would inherit the biases, and, in fact, that kind of model would exacerbate biases. But if you have outcome data, true outcome data, you can, then you should be able to correct biases. Now, there's still a caveat that if, suppose you default because the world is racist, um, or, you know, suppose you don't get promoted because the firm is sexist, um, then, you know, if, if the outcome is getting promoted, well, you know, you'll reinforce that bias. Um, but if you have a more objective outcome that is not tainted, that's where you can get the, the best bias correction. No, just one thing. So I think the conclusion there is that that's where research is useful, which is we can categorize. If, exactly like Antoine said, if the outcome is an observable objective fact, then the machine probably is going to debias itself over time. If instead you're using the machine to replicate something that people would have done, then in fact it's not going to debias, it can go even the other way. So I think that's where, we, and so to the extent we use observable outcomes, I think we can be reasonably optimistic. The, the place where I think the biases could be worse is, is what Antoinette was showing earlier, which is if the borrowers or uh, if the, uh, the clients themselves have behavioral biases mm -hmm. and the machine learns how to exploit these biases mm -hmm. in a smart way. That, so that's different, you see, I mean, that's a very different way, but I think this could be an issue actually. Which is why it's so important that we figure out how to get competitive incentives to have the firms more aligned with their customers. Um, because th the optimization can be used for good or for bad and the incentives really matter and when we have firms whose sort of mode of competition is to say, you know, we're on your side, trust us, we're really trying to, to promote your financial health, and, the, and they create a reputation for that, and they line up the incentives properly, then all of that personalization can be used to figure out exactly how to manipulate you to do good things for yourself. Um, but the exact same tools uh, can <laughs> exploit you if, if your incentives are wrong. Let's go back to the audience and uh, see whether we have any, any further thoughts. <laughs>
someone <laughs> I can <laughs> go ahead. See. Okay. Yeah, the, yeah you. Yeah, so, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to ask your opinion on. So you talked about this interaction between the consumers and the firms regarding data privacy and issues of related to that. But we also have this parallel interaction between the government and the firms on the use of data, for example, for national security issues and the issues that go hand in hand with anonymity of data. So I was just wondering what are your opinions on that. Mm. Uh, yeah, very good, very good question. Anyone on that? So, yeah, the question was about the relationship between governments and firms on, you know, security. I mean, again, I think that this is another place where, as researchers and academics, we need to be really important part of the conversation. We need to educate society about what our choices are and, you know, consider where where we fall on the spectrum of trusting our government and getting more you know safety and you know crime protection and deterrence and things like that against um, you know more freedom but you know potentially more risks from sort of everyday sorts of, of crime and and we have to participate in the conversation certainly all of this data observability is complement it's complementary with authoritarianism it you know makes centralized government centralized control control of citizens much cheaper um, and more efficient which can get citizens to buy into it uh, as well and so you know it, it's it's more important than ever to have citizens be part of that conversation um, I, and I, of course, there's a trade-off there as well. One reason in the U.S., you know, we, ha we haven't been, we, we don't have a national kind of identity system, which is creating massive, massive, massive costs on, our, on, our, on every firm, on every entrant, on every financial transaction. But, you know, of course, the, those concerns about, um, about individual freedoms are at least part of the reason we haven't done it. I think so. I, of course, I agree with what Susan uh, said. The the issue with government had, there is another layer, which is the international cooperation. I think the, the 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 issue you mentioned is the main reason why we will never have the same. We will not have Basel II for data protection. You mm -hmm. see, because precisely for that reason, because governments around the world could, could could agree on safe limits on leverage ratios for banks, um, but. You know, they will not. You will not have an agreement between China, the U.S., and Europe on proper level of privacy protection for obvious reasons. So that and that's gonna that's gonna filter back to uh, what banks are allowed to do. And therefore, the uh, even the idea of like you know, in banking, global banking, we think about level playing field. You know, rules of the game that are more or less the same. None of that is ever gonna happen in the privacy part. So that's gonna be a lot more complicated going forward uh, on the global scale. I think that's gonna be a major difference. Actually, yeah, let me just uh, show you one chart that uh, I didn't uh, focus on, which is exactly this idea. I mean, if you, um, if you just uh, take a poll across countries um, of uh, you know, how much the citizens of that jurisdiction value privacy, you get uh, very different results. And I think this is actually you know, one of the issues that uh, is going to be uh, an impediment to, I think, a sort of universal standard. I think. Uh, I think Susan's point about uh, digital ID. So I think privacy is a is a luxury. Is a luxury good? That's what you It's uh, possibly, possibly, or at least on this on this scale. But it's um, but it's uh, you know it. Um, I think digital ID is a fascinating uh, issue because um, you know many countries do have national ID numbers, but not all of them have digitized it for either for public services provision or for indeed uh, you know, private financial services uh, provision. And it's partly the technology, but I think most of it is actually uh, the, the um, if you like, the lack of consensus on, on having something uh, you know, which is fully digitized. And I think this kind of chart reflects uh, um, uh, some of those issues. And uh, I think the issues get even more difficult when the digital IDs are then linked with biometric information, and then you know you can actually use the same ID for uh, in all purposes. I mean, many countries do have digital ID um, uh, systems for particular purposes. You know, if it's for uh, you know if if it's for voter registration, you would just use it for that purpose. If you know if it's for financial services, you would just use it for that. Um, but uh, you know, if you had just one digital ID for everything, then I think that would actually raise another you know, layer of issues, which I think would be uh, uh, would be very much. Uh, I mean, it would it would raise issues that um, uh, would uh, you know go against some of the uh, you know some of the findings here. Um, but 
going back to the public provision, um, I mean, if we think about the, the evolution of the internet, uh, I mean, there are some aspects there where, you know, with common addressing standards, with the TCP IP protocol, I mean, there were these very basic standards which uh, were, if you like, the underlying bedrock for all the flowering of the financial service, well, all, all the private sector uh, services that actually, you know, were, were built on top. And uh, I just wonder whether we can think about, uh, you know, something similar for the payment system as well, where if we had uh, something that uh, has common addressing standards you know, or interoperability where you can access um, uh, through, you know, one bank's app uh, your accounts uh, in, you know, held in another bank, for example. This is something that, uh, you know, several countries using the open banking system, uh, you know, can, can already do. I mean, that would be perhaps one way of maybe, you know, squaring the circle of having the innovation being done primarily by the private sector, but underlying it, there's a bedrock of, if you like, the, the foundational public goods are there, uh, which, um, you know, doesn't have to be publicly provided, but it's uh, something that needs a uh, very broad consensus among all the, among all the actors, uh, some kind of standards that are actually set. I don't know what, what, what you feel about that, Susan. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the details obviously have to be worked out, but I, I, I do think that we're lacking some of that infrastructure and certainly like, you know, getting fast payments, for example, instant payments, we, we see the countries that have gotten that infrastructure, which is guided very carefully and implemented by the governments, then leads to greater economic activity and, you know, more, more use of, of financial services. So. That, that certainly seems like something that we should be moving forward on. Um, you know, there, there are many possible ways to, to do it, but banks should be able, in, in you know, 2020, we should be able to move funds you know, instantly 24-7 around the world and, and getting the infrastructure in place, whether it's you know, provided by there, a, a set of, whether, whether there's a set of competing fintechs that Provide, offer the services, the software to do it, and then the regulators, you know, facilitate that and bless the use of it, or whether, you know, banks together come up with their own architectures. That's, I think, a design question that requires research. But the role of government in, in pushing us t towards that and saying, no, that's gonna, the new equilibrium is going to look like this, and and this is where we're going, and we're going to we're going to encourage that I think that's very important and by the way we see in you know Asia and you know a number of parts of the world that are poorly served by today's system the central banks are in fact pushing for that kind of innovation because their entire country is at a global disadvantage when they have to pay higher fees to do international commerce um, or, or, and also they many many countries are harmed by expensive remittances so those countries are, have been often at the forefront while it's the more developed, richer countries where their banks are profiting from the existing system that sometimes go more slowly. Right. I mean, the, the difficulty often is though that it's exactly the countries where the government itself is part of the provision of financial services and either benefits from it or distorts some of it, right? That, that actually make it very difficult to improve efficiency. So, you know, kind of at the extreme, right, if you look right now, Venezuela is one of the places where cryptocurrencies are used the most because the government itself, um, you know, and, and the, the fiat currency of that country is obviously so distorted that you, their citizens, you know, kind of cannot move money across the system. And um, so I think, that's kind of the constraint for, for this global consensus, in, in my opinion, and maybe at a less dramatic way, but you know, kind of if you look at many other emerging market countries where either <clears throat> the government, the banking se sector has a large government footprint, um, where right there's a lot of government ownership. If you look at many of banks, if you look at many Asian countries, um, there actually the government has an active interest in not allowing this type of competition and allowing fees to actually drop because inefficient state-run banks um, are benefiting exactly from that, right? And so there, I think, um, we'll, we'll need kind of smart regulation, right, to, um, you know, kind of to allow maybe a tiered entry of different countries into those, you know, I into a more international platform. I think there will be also competition between the states on that one. I mean, the question, for instance, of, uh, you know, 
cryptocurrencies uh, issued by central banks. It's not an if, it's a when and who's going to be first. And so the, the, the game there also is a little bit different because I think to some extent countries are going to be in competition with one another in that dimension. And I think the issue is to make the competition productive across um, state actors as well. So, Tom, I think you, uh, you teed it up nicely for, for, a, for a future panel on central bank digital currencies. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is certainly something that uh, you know, we, we, we in the policy community are, uh, are thinking very hard about. And um, uh, I think we, you know, we may, uh, you know, we may you know, you know, have some more light on this, if, on, on this issue. Um, we are coming to the end of our allotted time. Uh, there's perhaps uh, time for one more question, if, uh, if there is. Oh, there's, there's one at the back, yes. Yeah. So I think the first question um, was um, uh, what the regulators are doing to address some of these issues. And secondly, and the second question was about um, uh, how can machine learning be applied for the, for the business model of the banks. I think both of the questions were actually covered indeed. So um, uh, I, I think this is being recorded, but I think, do, do you want to give a, give a quick, um, uh, just give a quick summary. Well, so I guess something we, we haven't come back to much in this in this discussion part is just the I think we we all focus on the consumer services because that's what's familiar to us. But actually, the the way the machine learning and automation is being used is mostly on back end stuff. And even like I'm I'm on the board of Ripple, which does this international payments. I should have mentioned that earlier, but you know they they're basically um, per, they're business to business entity that is helping banks move money between each other and not and and the software isn't the everything about how the consumer interacts with the system is is unchanged and so i think a lot and then on the automation side as well it's most of what financial institutions do are back-end processes and most of what's happening is making those back-end processes automated and more efficient which of course also has implications for workers and labor and other stuff which we didn't even talk about today so I think that that's, um, it's happening and it's, it's going to have a very large impact and that's where the regulation actually is going to matter is how well do we help banks become more efficient so that they can get costs down. Hmm. Any final words from, from, from the two of you? I mean, to build on what Susan just said, um, though all these efficiency improving um, you know, kind of policies within banks will also have um, uh, effects on the incentive of workers and how actually employees interact with machine learning. And I, I believe that's a huge area where there can be massive improvements because you can, you know, kind of provide workers with more um, productive, in a way, platforms and systems that make them more productive, that incentivize them better. But you also need to be kind of mindful of the fact that you are creating now a system that probably has more room for individual discretion and therefore mistakes can actually be more corner solutions, right? And, and that's something I think where we, we still need to learn a lot, um, how the adoption of those systems affects the, affect the internal management of large organizations and, and large banks. That's perfect. Nothing to add. <laughs> on that, uh, on that um, uh, great harmony and consensus, uh, <laughs> let me let me close the panel. Uh, well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, it was it was great to uh, have have all of you. It's sort of the audience is sitting out, but uh, it was it was a very well uh, it was a very well attended panel. And um, uh, most of all, let me let me thank the three panelists for their for their great participation and and for the insights. So uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for taking part. Thank you.